Hi, everybody. Welcome into Quilt Lab with So Uncommon, where we create beautiful, whoops, beautiful patchwork in the hoop of our embroidery machine. Hi, I'm Diana. Thanks so much for joining us today for Quilt Lab. And today we're going to be quilting with birdie bird batting. Um, so if you caught our live event on Friday, you know we talked about birdie bird. It's kind of a new product to us here at So In Common, but it's been around, I think, since like 2019-ish or so. Um, and so today we're actually going to test it. Um, we talked about the things that we liked about it. We talked about the things that we had questions about. And so today's demonstration should help us fix or decide, it, uh, answer those questions. I think that's the best way to say it. And so we are going to be quilting in the hoop of our embroidery machine, but these tests probably would be the same for you if you free motion quilt or if you take your quilt to a long armor or if you are a long armor. Um, I would recommend, I believe, that if you take your quilts to a long armor, check with that person, um, show them the birdie bird batting, which I'm going to explain to you here in a second and then see what they say. I don't know how this will affect their their long arm. And of course, you wouldn't want to do anything to cause a problem there. Um, but today we're going to be testing it on a dream machine by Brother. That's what I'm going to be quilting on. Um, and then you, could, I think it would be the same idea if you do it free motion on your sewing machine as well. I'm also going to take you through the layout, the using of the template, all of that kind of thing. Um, but let's start with talking about what birdie bird batting is. Birdie bird batting is a 100% cotton batting and it, it's a good quality batting. I really do like it. Um, I use a pretty good high quality cotton when I use cotton and this is of an equal standard. So I don't have any concerns about that but it is covered with, it's sewn on. I've taken these two pieces apart so you can see it. What it has sewn on the top of it is a 100% um, cotton piece of flannel. Now I know some of you are saying, why in the world would you want two layers? The idea of the flannel, according to the instructions that are sent with the product, is that it keeps it from needing to be basted, okay? This piece goes on the backing fabric and then they're telling you to smooth out the top and just kind of free form it with your top don't baste your top down that is one point that i have a concern about after being a quilter for over 55 years i really highly recommend that you do at least a light spray based you're you're going to get slippage otherwise and you don't want that um, but I think the idea of using this flannel so that you don't have to base through it with pins and all could be really helpful. Now, it is going to add weight and warmth to your quilt. But if you want a warmer quilt, then super. Because, you know, years and years ago when I first started quilting with my grandmother, sometimes all we had was flannel. And we'd do one or two layers of flannel as our batting. And that's all we'd use, all we would use. So you're going to definitely get a, one, a, a warmer quilt, but we'll go through those particulars and all throughout the demonstration when we're doing the testing of this birdie bird batting, but that's what it looks like. I will tell you that the cotton flannel is a nice cotton flannel too, a good quality. So as far as the materials go, um, it is a good quality. Now they say that they're an eco-friendly company and I always look for things like that, but those words can also be trendy words too that don't mean a lot. So I'm not sure what they mean by eco-friendly because the creation of flannel and cotton is not overall an eco-friendly process. They are natural materials. So if I don't know what they mean by eco-friendly. So don't let that like be a big buzz word for you when you go to look at this if you do. We here at So Uncommon are not being supported or paid for to recommend this or to test it or anything. In fact, I don't know in the end if I'll end up recommending it, but I know one thing. There is no one-stop shop batting. There are lots of batting materials and they all work great for something. And so I would never tell you that this is the last batting you'll ever buy because 
there are reasons I definitely would not use this as my batting, but there are definitely reasons that I would. So um, we'll, in the future, we'll do some more videos on batting because I know some of you have had questions um, because there are, there are spe special reasons you use special battings. Okay. All right. Enough about that. So that is the Birdie Bird product. I will say it's a good quality product from what I've seen so far. Um, you can order it in a twin size bat, a queen size bat, or by the yard. So what I did, I actually saw this being advertised on social media. Um, I don't typically buy things like that from social media, but I was intrigued by it. So I bought a one yard bat at, um, I think, like $25. It's like $24.99 or something like that. And um, I'm definitely going to get my monies out of it because I'm going to use it. Um, um, it is a little more expensive than just buying batting, except when you get into some of the higher price specialty battings. But you are getting two layers, uh, two types of fabric. So I can see why the price would need to be a little bit higher. I would recommend if you want to try and buy this, go to their website, which is, let me take a look here. They sent me their card um, with the order, www.birdiebirdquilts.com, um, birdiebirdquilts.com, um, because they actually have the price at the best price that I saw on the internet. I looked at one site that had like the twin size batting for $103, which was, I thought, ridiculously expensive. Um, it's, I think the twin size might be $45 or something. So for two layers of good quality materials, I, I say that's kind of reasonable actually. Um, but it's going to be more than if you just go out and buy a general just straight up cotton batting probably, or especially if you're going to buy like a cotton poly batting. So what we're going to be quilting today is I have this large 24 by 24 inch expanded star block that I've had for a while. And I want it for my dining room table because I have a square table um, as a, a mat for it. Um, for when we're not eating, I guess so much of this is white, I'm not going to eat on top of it. But um, I thought we would quilt this today, it turned out really pretty, I really love it. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. At our next step, we're going to go over to the cutting table, I'm going to show you how it gets laid out, because there's some some specifics um, about not pre washing your fabric. Um, this says that you will get a three to five percent shrinkage when you wash your quilt so that you're going to get that very old puckered quilt look. I adore that look. Uh, that to me says quilt because that's how all our old handmade quilts used to end up. However, if you're someone that wants to wash but still have a pretty smooth quilt, that might not be the batting you want to use for that quilt. It might be the batting you use for a different project. So this is going to be on my dining table. So it's probably not going to get washed too often, but I suspect I'm going to need to wash it once just to see what that puckering up looks like. And it scares me a little bit because I love how this looks, but I think it'll, I think it'll turn out fine. So there are some things like that that we'll discuss over at the cutting table when we do the layout. I'm also going to show you how you use um, a template for quilting in the hoop. Then we're actually going to come back to my machine and I'm going to stitch um, a few of my um, um, uh, hoopings out for you so you can see how it's working. I, and then we're going to look at the back because I'm concerned, are we going to get bunching in the back because we've got two layers here plus the backing fabric and your top so that's more fabric that can even small micro scooches and things or squiggles and things can add a little bunching so i'm very curious to see how that's going to turn out we'll look at the front and the back of that and um we'll just see how it goes and then um those were kind of some of my questions so we'll find out and then you can judge for yourself based on what you see here and I'll judge for myself and give you my best opinion. So let's go ahead and head over to the other camera and the cutting board and get started with our demo of Birdie Bird batting. Okay.
Hi, everybody. Here we are at the um, my cutting table, and I have laid out my backing fabric and the birdie bird uh, batting. However, why don't we go ahead and review the birdie bird batting in a little more detail um, while we have it laid flat here? Now, these lines that you're seeing here, those aren't laser lines or anything like that. They are coming in through the blinds in the window in this room and I can't get the blinds any tighter closed so that that doesn't happen. So please just disregard these funny little light lines. They don't mean anything. They're just remnants of beautiful sunshine because it's a gorgeous day today. So here is that piece of birdie bird batting that I was showing you in the introduction today. And I don't know if you can see it, but I'm going to go ahead no, I'm not going to do it because you'll it'll would show through my fabric. But right here, you can kind of see it. Right here and right here, that is where the batting and the felt are sewn together. Okay, so that's what they do. That's the only way that the felt and the batting are attached with this product. Um, so if I lift up the batting, I can put my hand, see my hand down here? I can put my hand in this batting. Now, this is what concerns me is that when you quilt, especially with the embroidery machine, but really a lot of people do this when they free motion as well, you start in the center. My concern is, it's going to push this out and here at these seams, I can already see if I just, when I go to smooth it, it bunches right here at these seams. So we'll see how that turns out. It might flatten out. I don't, I don't know, but we'll see. That's what this test is all about, right? So here is our flannel. Here is our batting. Again, in the product information, it says, do not pre-shrink your backing fabric. Okay, don't pre-wash it. Um, you are going to get three to five percent shrinkage when you wash your quilt. And you're going to get that puckered up old timey quilt look. Again, I love that look. It might not be the perfect look for everything. For a bed quilt, wonderful. For a throw quilt, wonderful. You might not want that look on a wall quilt, and you might not want that look on a table topper. However, since this is going to go on a table, um, I'm going to have to wash it probably to see what it's like. So I'm going to end up with that kind of a look, whether I want it or not. That's fine. I'm, I'm groovy with that. So um, the other thing is that it says that when you hang your quilts after using this, you get no distortion. That cannot be true. Um, every quilt, regardless of the batting you use, will distort over time. And that's called gravity. And the heavier the quilt, the faster gravity is going to pull it down and start to distort it. So it could be at the beginning you won't see anything, but I don't know how fast it will distort because this is heavier. So, and personally, I think this would be a waste a really good batting for a wall quilt because you don't need the weight and you don't need the warmth. However, that technically is not the reason for this batting from what I understand. The reason for this two ply system is that this felt keeps your fabric from moving. So you can see I have my backing here and I have my batting here. And when I move it around, yeah, I'm not getting slippage and slidage. Everything is staying together. Because the way you lay it down is you lay your fabric down. Let's go ahead and remove the batting. And we'll do this as if we're starting from fresh. So here is my pressed piece of backing fabric. Believe it or not, it was pressed. <laughs> um, this is my backing fabric. I lay it right side down. And this is just um, a piece of that... Lori Holt B cross stitch that I made the kaleidoscope quilt with. It's a piece I had left over and it's going to work perfect as a backing for this little topper that I have the colors work and also I'm perfect with that. Now it says to lay your birdie bird batting, cut it the same size as your backing. I always give myself three to four inches 
um, on all sides bigger than my topper. You'll see that when we lay the top down. Lay it out, cut your batting and your backing the same size, and then smooth it out. And like I said, when I start to do this and smooth outwards, I'm getting some bunching at these sewn seams. So I don't know how, and there's no way to flatten that out because, I mean, if you don't press and smooth, it kind of evens itself out. But I'm concerned that you're going to end up getting some bunching. But we'll see. Again, let's not make a big deal out of it till we're done quilting and see how things turn out. So this is laid down, and it's laid down with the flannel side this side against your fabric because the idea here is that you don't have to baste with pins or baste with a basting spray and now what we're seeing here is our cotton batting all right let's bring in my top and i'm going to lay it down so my top is 24 by 24 I have cut my backing and batting 30 by 30. Um, and I've got a nice little amount on all four sides for the very idea of slippage. Now, when I do this, everything seems fine, just like normal. However, as I said before, see, there's nothing holding this on. The second I lift it or start to move it, this is going to slip. Now, in her demonstration video, to her credit, she has a big, beautiful table. Everything is laid out flat, and she's free motion quilting. So if I could do only this and not have to move it or put it in a hoop, maybe I'd give that a bit of a try. But because I'm going to be using it in a hoop in my embroidery machine, I just don't trust that I won't get slippage. So I'm going to lay back one corner. I am going to put a little bit of um, ODA 505 temporary fabric adhesive between my top and my batting. I know the idea is that it makes it really quick and you don't have to base this top, but to be honest, I'd rather be safe than sorry. And um, using basting spray, especially on these small projects, doesn't take you any time. So I don't really see a big time saver there. So I'm going to spray. Ooh, my pan might be almost empty. There we go. I'm going to spray. I always spray on my batting. I don't spray on my fabric. Getting a little, ah, there we go. That seems like a lot, but I wasn't getting really much out of there. That can is almost empty. I'm going to bring this back over and press this. Let me just, I know I've got a new can of 505. Let me grab it quick. There we go. Let me just get the, the little piece off here. I love the 505. There are several temporary fabric adhesives. June Taylor makes a great lightweight one. Um, I think the... ODIF 505 is just a nice all-round one. There are a couple of others um, that are heavier. I think they're a little overkill unless you're going to try and spray baste a full-size quilt. Then you might want something a bit heavier. So, okay, I'm, I, I'm not fully down on the very edges. That's okay. But in here, everything is nice. I'm going to roll this side back now. Give my can a little shake. I always shake my can, even though I don't think you really need to. Give a little bit of spray. See, not really much at all is needed when you're spray basting. And that took me, what, five seconds maybe? So it's not much. If I weren't explaining, I would have been done spray basting by now. And then I'm going to lay this out. And after I spray baste, folks, I always let it sit for just a few seconds while I'm doing this. It allows the temporary adhesive to do its thing. Now, if you are someone who truly doesn't like to use any kind of glue, any kind of chemical, this is going to wash away once you've washed it and all. But if you don't want anything like that in your quilt, then try it without. 
but honestly, I'd probably still pin it then. I just don't trust it not being basted on top. Um, not at least not in the format in which I quilt. All right? Are we good here? Yeah, we're good here. I, I'm never worried too much if my corners, in fact, I don't even worry about getting my corners. I just want a good amount down. So there we go. Now, there's no basting between the backing and the flannel, but to be honest, I'll be honest, I'm moving this around. I'm not getting any slippage between the back and the flannel. So I think in that respect, that flannel is doing the job that um, Birdie Bird Quilts intends it for it to do. Yay, we love that, right? All right, so here we go. We're all, we're all basic per se and ready to go. Just this is a smaller piece, but took no time at all. Now we're going to go ahead and place our template since we're doing this. Now, if you're free motion quilting, you won't need a template. I don't know. I don't think long armors use templates either. They might, but I don't think so. I think they have other ways of lining stuff up. Um, so here is the design I created. Very simple. It's called um, spiral flower or spiral star or something like that, but very simple little design. I've got it set at a three millimeter stitch length. So I get a nice hand look to my stitching, which I love when I do a machine type quilting with my embroidery machine. But here's my actual template ready to go. I have printed it off on a sticky back template paper. You could just do it on regular copy paper. And then what I would do is just use a little piece of your fabric tape, make the little loop and stick that on the back while you're placing it. And then you can peel it off. So my square here, my four by four in the center is eight by eight. So I make this, I back it off by half an inch and made my design seven and a half by seven and a half. And if you look at it right in there, that is just going to center up perfectly. Now, the way I'm going to quilt this, there's a lot of ways you could quilt this. So let's talk about a few. One, I could do an all over edge to edge type quilting. Regardless of whether I'm doing a custom quilting or an edge to edge quilting or a block by block by block quilting, which is technically what I'm going to do today, I will always start in the middle, either then work my way down, over, up, across, and down, or center, up, over, across, and down, some way like that. But I always start in the middle. Why? That does a couple of things. It solidifies the stitching in the center. You're not going to get this kind of bunching in here because it's been done first. Any bunching that would happen in your quilting would tend to happen in these outer edges. Now, here's an interesting thing about this piece. Here is that one seam in the, the batting and flannel, and here's the other seam. On this side, it's not going to be in my quilt. So if I get bunching there, it's not gonna matter. This one right here is going to be in the quilt. And so that's the place I'll have to look on this side to see if I get any bunching there. However, there is a seam right here, but because we're working outward, I'm thinking maybe we won't get bunching there. We'll see, that's, that'll be a nice part of the test for us. So on this quilt, if I did a edge to edge, I would have probably, usually edge to edge is done in rectangular. I like to turn them into squares. I've shown you how to do that in a previous video um, where I showed you how to translate the pattern with a free software. Um, I'll try to remember and link that for us at the end because that could be helpful for you depending on what patterns you're choosing if you haven't seen that one yet. Um, or what I could do is I could do something in every single block. To me, that's a lot of hoopings and a lot of overkill. I know I always like if I have something that's a four by four, something in the center, I always like kind of a medallion shape in my center. I just, I like that look, so I tend to do it. Now, what I could do is a medallion shape here, and then I could do like a rectangular shape here and here and here and here, 
and then figure something out around here. That's a more custom look. But if you look at how this top is made, I have a four by four block here, here, and here, 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 and here, 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 and here. Nine hoopings. That's all I'm going to need to do for this particular top. That shouldn't take me much time at all. So if I peel my template off of my paper, let me just slip that back here. I don't like to lose that because I like to reset it. I always come in with a marker. Can you see that? I put a little arrow there so I know where the top of my. Now, this is completely symmetrical. So I could put it down this way, this way, this way. It wouldn't matter. It's going to look the same. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you have a definite top. And so I always, always put that arrow there so I know where my top is. And I always keep a little pin. It doesn't have to be a glass head pin, just a little straight pin. What I do is I place it directly in the center. And with that free software I told you about, I was able to print this off with these crosshairs so that I know exactly where the center of this is. Now, I also know exactly where the center of this quilt is. It's right there in the center of that four by four, um, four patch. So I'm going to take my pin and I'm going to put it right in the center there, okay? Now, I'm gonna put that in the center and I'm just gonna rotate this so it's straight up and down. And what's nice about this being a four patch in the center, I can mark my pole lines, north, south, east, and west, right up on the pole lines in this and I can see through it so I can see it. This is directly in the center because this line here is running straight across my center horizontal line. This line here is running straight up and down my line. And I can line up that way in every one of these four patch squares that I'm going to quilt in because they all have that dead center. Super easy to do. So I'm lined up. I'll put my pin away. And then all I have to do now is take this over to my machine, um, line it up in my hoop. And I'm ready to go. Now I am using a magnetic hoop. The bottom of my hoop stays on my machine. I lay this on there. I put the top on. I adjust my needle to the center. I peel this away and I'm ready to go. And you'll see that here in a minute. If you are using a traditional embroidery hoop where you need to have the um you need to put the top and bottom together. Let me just grab, I just wanted to grab my screwdriver so I can take this hoop apart. Since this is seven and a half by seven and a half, I at least need an eight inch hoop. I think this is, this is my nine and a half by nine and a half inch hoop. So if I am using a traditional hoop, which is fine, if that's what you have, that's what you have. What I do is I kind of lay it down. And what I do is I kind of fold back and see where the center of this hoop, which is right in that little divot right down here. And I kind of see what line it lines up with. I know it's hard for you to see. Let me bring this up. What line it lines up with on my mat. So I know where that line is going to be. Now I'm going to lift this up, put it under, and make sure that that line is lined in the same place. And when I reach around here, there's my little divot with my finger. And yeah, I'm right where I should be. Great, so I'm set that way. Now I haven't undone my hoop enough. That's why I like using magnetic hoops. You don't have to worry about unscrewing your, your top and bottom hoops to get them in. But now what I would do is I would place this in here. Now, this is in here. It looks pretty close to being accurate, but it's not. It's way too high. It needs to come down some, so that's okay. I'm just going to put my hoop over my head again. And now I'll try it again. And with this method, you're going to need 
to play around a little bit to make sure, okay, that feels much better. The amount that I have here and the amount I have here, that's much closer. Yes, much, much better. And I'm gonna, I don't have mine, like I said, I don't have it unscrewed enough, but that's where I would be. Now I would take it to my machine. I would line up my needle, remove my template and I would quilt. And then I would have to bring it back to my table here for each and every hooping. That's why I love using a magnetic hoop because like I said, the bottom of my magnetic hoop stays on my machine and I just slide it around and can line it up super easily. And you are going to see that here in just a second because we are ready now to go over and start quilting. We're going to quilt this piece here and then we'll move one to each side so that we can get that side adjustment and see if we're getting any kind of um, if we're getting any kind of bunching or not. And this shouldn't take us very long. So, you know, maybe we'll quilt the whole thing today together. But we're ready. I've got it all laid out how Birdie Bird says to do it, except I did go ahead and use a little 505 spray between the top and the batting. I just feel like in my years of experience that that is necessary. You, of course, may do as you like. Um, because it's your quilt. You know how things work for you. You know what you like to do. However, if you're brand new, take my tip and do it um, with a little bit of 505. All right, let's go ahead and go over to the machine now. Okay, here we are at the machine and you can see I have my design right up here on my screen and I've got my quilt in my uh, frame, in my hoop and on the machine. Now I still have to adjust the positioning and I'm going to show you how to do that, but it's super simple and you'll see when we go to the next block how easy it is to move this around. But the first thing I wanted to talk to you about before we actually start the quilting is my thread choices. So this has a lot of white in it, but it also has a lot of other color in it. My favorite quilting thread is this right here. And I like to use it in almost every single thing I quilt because believe it or not, that color blends beautifully. It's almost an invisible blend with just about every color. I really love it. It's by Isocord. It's number 5220. I would call it a really light mint color. Um, and it turns out beautiful. That's what I have in my top thread. Okay, that's what we're going to see here on the top. On the bottom, because I'm using this um, uh, B cross stitch fabric from Lori Holt with the color and the white crosses on there, I'm using this color by Glide and it is number uh, 35405, Sa uh, Safre, S Z A F F R E, um, just 35405, that's the number of it. But that's what I'm using in my bobbin. So I get kind of an invisible look in the back. I could use white or creamy white, and you're definitely going to see it. I don't need to see it. I don't really want to see it. So that's going to blend nicely. That's in my mm -hmm. bobbin right now. So, um, and, and it's perfectly okay to do that when you're doing your quilting is to do a different color in the top and the bo bottom. On your sewing machine, sometimes you have to play with tension and all so you don't get those threads pulled up from the bottom and see them. Um, it typically does not happen in your embroidery machine, thank goodness. Um, okay, so here we are and I've still got my template on. And I can see right here, if I lower my foot, this machine requires I lower my foot. So can I bring that in any closer? You're not really going to see it much better. But if I look at this, I can see when I lower my foot halfway that that needle is not dead center. So I'm going to come over here. Okay, I have to lift this back up. That's fine. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to click move. 
Oh, okay. My needle's still considered down. Let me bring it all the way back up. Oh, and when I'm doing this, I don't have my needle threaded. That way I'm not always messing around with my thread. I thread it at the end once I'm in position. That's my number one tip when I do this is I don't thread until I'm ready to stitch. So I'm going to click move and I'm going to move my needle to the right a little bit and back a couple. Now I'm going to try it again. I'm going to lower my presser foot, lower. Oh, I am. Yep. I am dead on center. So I am exactly where I need to be to start my quilting right in the center. So now I'm going to, let's take that out. There's something going on here. Oh, here, hang on just a second. I didn't fully thread my upper pieces. Let me do that quick. Hang on. There we go. Okay. Oh, I'm wasting a lot of thread here by continuing to roll it out. That's okay. Why isn't it? What's going on here? We don't need that. There we go. There we go. I was hooked on something. All right. Hmm. Why isn't it? I'm just pulling this out. Okay. Seems to be okay now. I was doing something really weird. It wasn't wanting to move. I think it was too close and was getting caught. There we go. Now we'll go ahead and thread. My bobbin thread is already in. Get rid of that. Now I'm going to remove my template. And I kind of help it up the first couple of times because it's pretty sticky. I de-stick a little bit, but It's all smoothed out. Now I'm going to lower my foot and I'm going to click go and we're going to stitch the first hooping. Now I'm using my regular 70 uh, needle that I use for quilting. Um, I've got a three millimeter uh, stitch length. This seems to be going through the batting fine in a video that I caught a little bit of. Uh, the quilter who was quilting through motion said she was, it was kind of hard on her machine to stitch through. I'm not finding that to be the case yet anyway um, with my embroidery machine. So that's good. I'm so far, I'm not worried about that. It's stitching out beautifully. I don't really see any bubbling happening, like where I have the small pieces, just the normal amount of puff that you would see. This takes, okay, one hooping of this takes three minutes to stitch. So three times nine, it would take me about a half an hour to stitch this whole thing. So we won't stitch the whole piece on um, air today, but we will do a couple of hooping so that you can see and we can look at the back and see like what it looks like from hooping to hooping. And then I've been trying to get this done, so I'm actually going to finish this up today because I want to get this on my table. I'll, when I do, I'll pop a picture out and you guys can see it. And because I've left enough backing um, and on the back. I'm going to trim this batting off and then I'm going to use this to kind of do a self binding because it will work beautifully with the rest of it. I'm not going to worry about doing an independent binding on this piece. When I'm doing smaller pieces, especially pieces I put on the table and all, of course I like them to look lovely and beautiful, but I don't worry about them so much in the regard to my binding. So a lot of times I will do a self binding. You can call that laziness if you like. I just call it, it's a, it's a linen one and done. Let's get it out there and get using it. If it is a quilt, then of course I always use an independent binding. 
and sometimes I do on these smaller pieces. If this were going to hang on the wall, I'd probably do an independent binding, maybe something in this, maybe this greenish yellow here, that would be pretty as a binding. If I had a, if I made this so long ago. In fact, this piece is a piece. Now, if you start to get your pieces up into your throat here, just give them a nice little roll. Keep them out of your stitch area. Keep give them a little roll like that. This seems to be staying good. Um, I am not in seeing any difficulties at this point. Um, but I think I made this piece when I was just figuring out how to digitize my build a quilt system because this piece is old. This is about six years old and I started working on the build a quilt system about six years ago. All right, my first hooping is done. Now, this is the magic kind of, of using a magnetic hoop. All I do is slide that off. My bottom hoop stays on. I don't have to mess with that. And then I can slide it over and start. And we'll do that in a minute. But let's take a look at this first hooping. Wow, it's stitched out nicely on the front. But let's look at the back. It's stitched out really nicely on the back. Now, if I wash that and get shrinkage, yes, I'm going to get a lot of pucker and stuff in there. But, you know, I do like that look. So I don't have a big problem with it. That turned out lovely. Now, I can't really tell if I'm going to get bunching until I do some on each side. So let's go ahead and move this to the next section. And I'm going to move it down one. So the first thing I'm going to do while I have it la laid out right here, I'm going to take my pin and my template, my sticky template, and I'm going to place it on my fabric. I could do that while it's up here, but it's a little bit easier to manage right here. So I'm going to lay this pin. I'm going to put it directly in my center. I'm going to rotate this. And I'm going to line up these north, south, east, west lines again right on the seams of that four patch. Oh yeah, perfectly lined up again, just like before. Super duper simple to do that. Alrighty, now I'm going to bring this up into my hoop. What I like to do before I put my top on is I like to try and get my needle kind of where it needs to, or my piece right kind of under that needle where it needs to be so I don't have to do a lot of movement. Now, I'm just going to slide that back on. Yeah, you might need to adjust a little bit. Okay, yeah, that's good. Everything looks good there. And see, because I've left myself extra batting and backing, my hoop is off the top, but it's still got something to hold on to there. So that worked out great. Now, obviously, my there's my center and my needle's kind of up in that way. So we're going to do a little movement and move it down a little bit. And I'm going to move it over to the left a little bit. Now I'm going to lower my foot and I'm going to, again, remove my thread from the eye of the needle. I am a little bit to the left. So I'm going to bring my foot back up and come back over this way twice. Down. Let's put my needle down. Oh, perfect, right on. And see how easy that is to line up when you have a template? That's why if you want precision um, alignment, when you do your um, piecing in the hoop, you absolutely must use a template. People, I know there's a few people out there that say, oh, I just wing it and I get it right every time. You've got a really good eye and I congratulate you. I could never do that. I'm going to move my whole machine this way. Oops, I just unplugged it. Oh, darn it. Okay. I'm going to have to take this out of the arm while it adjusts. Let's give it just a moment. Bring my piece back up. All right, those things happen. I shouldn't really have to do any readjustment again because it should be right back in the right spot. There we go. But we're going to check it. 
Oh, see, it isn't in the exact same spot. All right. So I'm going to lift this. I need to see. Now you see what you do when you're doing I think I am never always, I'm not perfect. So, yep, now I'm right on where I need to be. Lift that up. And now I'm going to thread my needle. Okay. I'm going to remove my template. There we go. Everything's nice and smooth. And there we go. And we're going to do our next stitch out, our next hooping. Very, very, very simple to do. Not hard at all. But that's the one nice thing. I'm going to be able to do this whole top, the clipping of the whole top, in about 30 minutes. Now, for me, I could not do that freehand or free motion. I tried doing free motion quilting for years and years and years and years, and I just never was able to get good at it. I'm not a good drawer. I, I would doodle. I can doodle with the best of them. When it comes to doing this thing, I'm not good at it. I don't know why, but I, I when I discovered that I could do it with my embroidery machine, I gave up caring. Now, you might care. You might be a free motion person. And I know there are a lot of people, a lot of books, stuff that will help you learn free motion. Huh, that's interesting. Is that on? Oh, this is interesting. So if you see the loop up here, it's this loop is not on this center, this north line here, but it isn't. The, this isn't a straight up and down. This is a design that's a little off kilter. So if you see that, don't worry about it. It's not off center. It's just not a design where these up and down loops match up to the center. You can see how beautifully this color is blending and you can see on the back how beautifully this blended with the backing fabric. Now, my husband, he has a cousin who I adore and she is a quilter extraordinaire and she does she's had art quilts that have toured the country hung in museums and all kinds of things and her work is just to say it's exceptional is not to give it its due i mean it's really incredible it's pure art um i could never do that it's not my thing I am purely a patchwork girl. <laughs> I like doing a little applique from now and, uh, and now and again, but I am a pure patch. But that's what my grandmother taught me, and that's what I love because I love doing more geometric kind of things. Like when I draw and all, I can draw geometric things, but like people and flowers. I took an art class once, and my teacher, bless her heart, I knew her very well. She was a family friend, and she said after about three weeks in class, she said, Diana, maybe we should put you in a different type of art class because I couldn't draw. She was having me draw a little blue bird on a, on a branch. I couldn't do it for anything. I mean, just I gave it my best, but I could not do it. And that's all right. It's not everybody's, that's not everybody's skill set. This is my skill set, and I love it. And now I can hand quilt with the best of them, too. But when we started doing all this free motion quilting on machines, I was cool with piecing on my machine, but the free motion quilting, oh, I just, so I was doing hand quilting for years before I finally, you know, learned that I could do it with my embroidery machine. Okay, let's just pop my top loop off. Now let's look at this one. Oh, it turned out beautifully. I just love it. Look at that. Just gorgeous. Now let's flip it over and see what we're looking at on the back. Beautiful. Now you see that right there? That's my little tie-off point. That's a lot of extra thread there that's not going to break. I don't need to bury it, although you can bury your thread if you want to. You would just lift up your thread like you would with anything, draw it up through your needle and bury it. But on the back, that little bit, I don't worry about it. But you don't see this blue color coming through in the front here. 
and that's looking great but let's turn it over now and see the difference between these are we getting any bunching no not up and down we're not getting any bunching up and down although again i will say that when this shrinks if it does shrink that three to five percent there will be because there are some small spaces here but no smaller than you would get with free motion or long arm quilting so you're definitely going to get that puckered old timey quilt look and again i say go for it i love it but i think we will stop there I'm going to finish quilting this, but like I said, this takes three minutes per segment and we're already almost 20 minutes in on this segment. So let's go ahead. I will put my template there for now. Let's go ahead and let me bring up my other camera and we will finish off for today. Move that out of the way.